yes you can start now so good evening everyone i'm vishnavi shrivastav and i welcome you all to this another session for the aws cloud practitioner training this is our session 3 It is a esteemed honor that Mr. Sanjit Jain, a guaranteed AWS master and APN ambassador, is among us to mentor us and guide us through this journey of learning. He has been involved in more than six editions of Values, conceptualizing the planning and building of applications delivered on AWS. Amongst his various achievements, he has won the AWS Certified Data Analyst Specialty and the AWS Certified Database Specialty. also he is the aws certified devops engineer we are glad to have you here sir thank you vishnavi for that warm welcome i'm always happy to be part of this aws user group that are doing uh this feels like a third session doesn't seems like it is part, third session but yes is it uh the third session hopefully everyone is doing good and been safety in this pandemic time and yeah uh and have really Gone through the uh, recordings as well as the presentation from the previous two sessions. So yeah, should we start? Awesome. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, should we start? So yeah, I think as Rashmi we mentioned, uh, today we will be focusing on a uh, third session or third edition in this entire training. Uh, I would say the workshop or the training what we have done. so far so in the first session if i recap we have understood what is exactly the introduction part of it uh, introduction to cloud computing introduction to aws introduction to if, uh, the aws training and certification program and the cloud practitioners in the second section we went a deep dive a bit into basic other services like s3 ec2 or uh, iams billing those are very important services with demos and all which is like a fundamental irrespective whether you're focusing on the certifications or you're focusing on the your career in the cloud computing so that's what we have done uh, need not to worry if you guys were not able to attend that session due to some personal front uh, we have the sessions already uploaded on the youtube channel of aws user group the presentation which we have been showcast in that both the sessions are in there in the github uh, the link will be forwarded by in a while by the team uh now we will be focusing continuing our last session of part 2 we will be focusing to deep dive into services which were left we are not able to cover in the last sessions uh the things like serverless database glue vpc cloud formation cloud integration dev developer tools monitoring shared responsibility and data architect i'll try to cover up all the possible things which are left in this session so we can ensure that by end of the session we cover up all the possible things which is required from cloud practitioner point again i'll recap the same thing a uh, kind of a note which i mentioned in the last session also in the same thing again i have tried my best to go through the different documentation different blogs to cover up the knowledge but again please consider this is a droplet from the entire ocean which i was able to capture if you need to go through and understand and deep dive in any of the services please go through the aws blog the best universal single source of truth you will get from there uh i have just tried to make it more generic uh, and the requirement or the level of expertise is more from terms of cloud practitioner but there are others uh, certifications you have or if you want to be an sme in one specific thing let's say for example lambda or s3 or ec2 aws documentation is the best thing you should follow okay so just don't rely on my presentation itself in terms of if you want to do some hands on experience or some production scale experience please also follow the blogs the tutorials which are given by the aws experts or the uh, solution architects please follow those tutorials as well as the blogs that will help you to get more deep dive or more advanced concept of it so let's jump into the first topic of today's which is aws serverless what we have uh, i think everyone on this uh, audience side we are hearing a lot serverless 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 right everywhere i mean cloud computing if you talk about the second thing which you uh, the most frequent term which is look forward is always serverless but what exactly is serverless right so serverless basically is like more around that you don't have to it's a cloud native platform uh, where you don't have to worry about uh, in, uh, installation of any sorts of os maintaining patching nothing no networking and all right 
so what exactly you do let's say for an example i am a python developer i know as a python developer what i know best is how to write a code in python in case of serverless uh, technologies that's what only i should be knowing that if i'm a python developer if i'm a java developer dotnet developer or node js developer i just need to be sure that i know how to write the code and rest will be taken care by the aws team to provide that right so what they do is they provide a very cloud native platform for short duration stateless computation and event driven which scales up scales down instantly and automatically and charge for actual usage at a milliseconds granularity so here if you see this particular i have intentionally broken down this entire definition in a very meaningful way so here you see there is nothing is been mentioned anything about configuration what as what exactly everything is mentioned is you should know how to write the code you should be knowing that the code is very event driven don't know we will also go through a deep dive you should it automatically scales up and scales down and it only charge you for milliseconds we never have mentioned about uh, you should have uh, been configuring it you should use the right compute because all those things is been taken care by this word when you see every any word like this cloud native managed service there exactly that means aws will do the heavy lifting part you have to ensure that you write the code which is very meaningful you follow the certain best practices for that services rest will be taken care by your aws so here the best practice has been here uh let's say for example the best example is lambda uh everyone will be knowing it or if you don't know it lambda can only live up to 15 minutes so let's say if you have any application which is running for 30 minutes that will not be able to fit into lambda so that kind of small things you need to take care when you're working on serverless technologies when you're selecting any one you need to ensure when you are going through it you ensure that there are certain limits and you have to write the applications either to fit into that limit or if it is going above that limit because of business logic then you select the another best service what you can do for it like for example if you are more than 15 minutes if lambda doesn't work, uh, work well for you you can use things like fargate which is a serverless container so those kinds of switch you need to take care based on the type of business application the second important thing of serverless is stateless so for example in case of ec2 instance now you already i assume you already know what is ec2 instance so in case of ec2 instance the documents get saved like very simple example if you guys were not able there in the previous lecture your laptop or your new mobile so whatever you do in your laptop maybe you're doing a kind of chrome search or you have any document that gets saved in your location or the browser history gets saved right so that's a stateful that it maintain or it's preserve the history in case of stateless whether it's a fargate or it's lambda it's a stateless that means let's say if you have invocation as one whatever processing you have done let's say you get the final answer as 10 final answer equal to 10 let's say you do some arithmetic operation or what you are doing and you get a final answer as 10 let's say you do a second invocation the second invocation will never know that the output from first invocation was answer as 10 directly unless you use things like dynamo db and all to persist the state ex uh, explicitly out of the way but from lambda from first invocation to second invocation there is no communication so it is stateless it doesn't remember what i have done in my previous invocation so that is stateless and it is event driven so event driven is something it's very simple some event some event occur and on based on that event lambda gets triggered oh that's a very beauty of lambda i would say and the best example can be let's say you upload a file in s3 when you upload a file in s3 for example what you are doing is you are firing the put api of s3 so that is an event an event is nothing but anything what you do anything which you play around with any of the services which is in case of s3 it was just uploading a file maybe in case of ec2 instance you are launching an ec2 instance so what you are doing is you are launch an ec2 instance so there you fire launch ec2 so create ec2 or launch ec2 so on that particular event there is particular lambda you can invoke for very simple of it let's say you upload a file or you upload a jpeg file into an s3 bucket which triggers a lambda and lambda creates a thumbnail of that jpeg image so those kinds of simple things what you can do which was a very simple example but very a complex thing where you can do let's say for example if someone try to break into your account and do some unauthorized access based on those events lambda can trigger and maybe let's say block the access or rotate the passwords or do some complex kinds of or even simple of it alerts you that someone is trying to get into your account those kinds of things also you can do with the help of uh, this event driven application the number of invocation i have personally seen uh, in my professional career i have invoked somewhere around like 5000 to 6000 lambdas at a second when i said at a second not even a difference of a second i fired like 
at a 5,000 to 7,000 lambdas in a flow and it worked fine. I was like 100% success of doing that around. So it automatically scales up and scales down automatically. I don't have to do anything there. And the charges are also millisecond. So it's very small charges, like whatever you consume, you have to pay for it. So that's as simple as that. What you're getting out of it, great agility, less overhead, better focus, increased scale, more flexibility, faster time to market, right? So those are the advantages. It's very simple from the name itself, great, greater agility. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. You just have to write your code very well and follow the best practices. So you, you get a faster way of development cycle. Less overhead. You're not configuring anything. You're not patching anything. Patching is like uh, ensuring that your OS has been up to date or not and all those stuff. Better focus. As a developer, I'm only focusing on writing the best quality of code rather than worrying about my compute scales or not, whether I have proper load testing or not. Those kinds of things, I mean, ease out. Increased scale. My productivity get increased because I'm only focusing as a developer, not as a uh, DevOps. More flexibility and faster because I have to only write my code and I don't have to worry anything. I can easily reach out to the faster, I mean, to the market very fast. So that's the advantage of serverless. And what's exactly serverless? That's why it's very boom in the market. Now, in case of serverless, so far we have understood in the previous slides why it is interactive. Serverless means no server or worry less about server, right? Ideally, I'll be very honest for serverless it's no server for us as a customer of aws i will say customer in sense of like we are leveraging lambda so it's no server for us but just a fact behind the scene when you launch or when you request to spin up any lambda there is a server which get deployed i would say which is for from an aws perspective just remember that it need not to worry about it no one is going to ask you that but ideally serverless means no server because we don't see any server get launched so behind the scene, it does get it, but not for us. And what you do is you just only have to write code, a beautiful code, well formatted, well tested and up to the business logic. So you only learn run code on demand on a request basis. So as I mentioned about event driven architecture, right? Event driven architecture is not that it keeps running 24 by seven. It only runs when some event occur. That's what we heard up or learn about event driven programming. So that's what it is run code only on demand on a per request basis so whenever there is an event which is a request based on that request you run your code making app development ops dramatically faster cheaper and easier for sure you don't have to do load testing you don't have to configure patching the server all those stuff gets ease out of it that's it makes very easy for you to do an app development and reduce the devops part or the operational part very soon and then drives the infrastructure cost now, infrastructure, how, what that means of infrastructure cost is you have EC2 instance, which is running 24 by seven, whereas you have a Lambda, which runs, let's say, uh, 500 times for last 24 hours. For sure, Lambda will be much more cheaper because it only get invoked for, let's say, 500 times for five minutes versus your EC2 instance, which is running 24 by seven. So that's the difference between driving the cost infrastructure. But one of the important thing you also need to understand, as I was talking about previously, the time constraint, uh, you all, it's very important for you to choose the right thing from a trying to provision. If we talk about versus on-prem VMs, uh, on-prem VMs, VMs is nothing but EC2 containers like Kubernetes, ECS, Fargate to serverless. The time to provision, as you can see, uh, weeks to months on-prem because we need to get the hardware, set it up, blah, blah, blah. We have to do other activities. In case of EC2, it's few minutes because you need to get it, bootstrap, I mean, configure the EC2 instance and then have that ready. Container is very easy because you deploy the application, which is an abstraction layer on top of EC2 instance. So you just deploy the application, container applications on top of it. So serverless is in milliseconds. So that we is pretty sure that how it is very fast. From a utilization perspective, you will see from left to right, serverless will be highest. As I mentioned about utilization is more, how effective you're consuming the compute power which you have deployed. So the same example of EC2 instance, uh, you have on-prem, which is running low, uh, VMs, which is higher, container is higher because you have different applications running on the container, uh, your container platform on the same container platform and serverless is highest because you only spin up from that particular perspective and only as and when required based on event driven. And charging granularity is uh, in on-prem, it's capex, you have to make a long-term investment in VM, it's hourly basis or even minutes basis in certain cases, minutes and second basis. Container same minutes and seconds and serverless is block of milliseconds. 
so that's also you can see a difference outside to not just focusing as a developer but if i if we compare other metrics like time to provision utilization and charging you will see a significant differences when it compares to between on prem and the serverless so that's why one of the another way why serverless is more attractive and same if we present this out from terms of increasing business focus on y axis and decreasing your concerns on over stack implementation you will see a significant difference uh, bare metal as we know uh, it's become really difficult bare metal is nothing but what you have as a like a dedicated kind of a server for you on the cloud like a physical dedicated server for you no one can be shared it just for you and your company ec2 is more like virtualized or shared environment ecs is like ecs ecs is more like a container family and lambda is more like a serverless so as you keep going around uh, the serverless technology you get a better productivity around the business logic as well as you decrease the concern of stack implementation so that's where the serverless stands and this is exactly the thing which we learn about the event driven programming so these are the different event source which can be anything as i mentioned someone try to uh, hack into your account or let's say you simple of example can be you try to upload an a uh, file in s3 or you try to launch an ec2 instance there in short there is a change in a state of any resources which is called as an event that when there is a change in a state that occurs this triggers lambda function which can be written in any of the programming language and then lambda function does the business logic which has been there like for example uh the one which i mentioned a simple example i upload a file jpeg file in s3 i've written a code in lambda let's say no js or any programming language which just the thumbnail generation and save it to another bucket so i upload a file of jpeg in s3 the lambda gets triggered lambda reads that image process that image generates a thumbnail and save that thumbnail back to anything which anything can be your on prem your external internet or it can be aws services in our case for this example it's s3 so it will write it back to s3 as a thumbnail in another bucket or in same bucket in another folder so that's simple as an event driven program there is a change in a state that triggers a lambda lambda does any business processing and saves the output back so that's how the lambda gets triggered and what's exactly the event programming model is so here we end the uh, serverless part of it now i'll go to the database and again sorry i missed out to add please feel free to add your questions in the chat after this database sections i'll go through all the questions and i'll try to answer most of the them what has been there in the chat so we'll go through the database services now i mean database is very common for you guys uh, with the term itself like you would have worked on let's say sql server or oracle mysql or even postgres no sql in your uh, undergrads i would say all you guys are from colleges or even from working professions so you would have gone through this basic database itself so here we will be learning in this particular section how aws provides the same paradigm on the cloud okay so yeah first is aws rds when i say rds is exact the same relational database service relational database service is a kind of i would say a service uh, of wrapper in which aws provides you the entire capability which you were doing on prem or with respect to database the different types of database engine over the cloud with very cost effective resizable uh, capacity easily scale up scale down with proper security and iam control that is what provides on the cloud the same what you do on on prem where you are responsible for managing the hardware uh, patching up all those stuff even doing the backup of that database you are solely responsible responsible for it where aws simplify that on the cloud by providing that same services same database even same version right with much more control and much more productive way and different engines which are provided by aws under rds is amazon aurora microsoft sql server mysql maria db postgres sql and oracle amazon or aurora is more of an customized offering from aws itself so if you see amazon aurora aurora is very cheap i mean cheaper than the rds service itself and 10 times faster than the rds server and it provides two database engine underneath it mysql and postgres so it's another customized offering which aws provides under amazon aurora and other other things which outside to the different functionality what you are already doing in on prem it continues doing and when i say on prem that doesn't mean actual server your desktop is also considered as a non prem for me right anything which is physical device that's an on prem so even if you have some mysql 
or ph admin like most of the people do php admin or ph admin they also use uh, deploy things like mysql around it or for uh, school, college projects you have oracle in it uh, so those kinds of things run in your laptop itself right so that's exact that can be one of the example in your case certain people who are coming from an uh, enterprise on prem experience you guys know what i'm trying to add from here so going back like outside database engines the different security different operational simplification what amazon provides it also provides the capability to highly available <clears throat> database any web application whether you guys are already working in an industry environment cloud industry or you are not uh, let's say you are just going to enter into the cloud industry irrespective of that you will see the very common service in any solution whether it's multi uh, whether it's machine learning whether it's data lake whether it's any sort of application development or any other i would say service or solutions you are talking about database is a core or core fundamental services database s3 are the core fundamental services you will see in each and every solutions maybe the proportion will differ based on the type of solution but they are very core services in all the solutions there it becomes very important that the services what we deployed are highly scalable and are available let's say the example which i mentioned in the last uh, practice when you're talking about the scaling the auto scaling thing today i have 1000 users so i deploy my website or i deploy my application for 1000 users let's say tomorrow i have a sale where i know very well i can predict that my 1000 will increase to 10000 or it can also increase by one more time which is 1 lakh how i can ensure my application will scale based on aws auto scaling service for ec2 but how i can ensure my database should also scale because let's say my ec2 scales 10000 but my database is still one still you will have a failure chance because your application is tightly integrated even though it's built in a layer approach your database is a core functionality for all those ec2 instances so if your database is not scaling still there is a chance of failure where you have on the application layer so that's why it's very also important that you highly focus on your database services with things like multi az is provided by aws multi az read replica those are the mechanism provided by aws under rds to provide that scalability approach and in case of multi az precisely uh, oracle postgres mysql maria db uses the amazon failover technology so if something goes wrong and if you have multi az setup like one other az aws will take care of automatically switching over to the another az where your passive service has been running and in case of sql server db it uses sql server mirroring that's a different technology but it do ensure that i which of the engine you are working on some or other way it provides a multi az kind of an setup so if something goes wrong you have another environment ready to serve or continue your business application as i also mentioned about the backup in case of amazon or in case of amazon rds it provides the two kinds of backup option one is an automatic backup and one is a manual in case of automatic backup when you deploy the entire rds you provide that okay this is my time window like for example you know very well that none of the people this applic uh, let's say you're building an application that application will only be accessible by indian users so it's a pretty uh, easy to uh, portray that 1 am or let's say 2 am ist mid and night no one is going to access my application so 2 to 3 am is the right time that i can do my all the maintenance activity by aws so that is a duration maintenance window duration which you can specify when you're launching the rds and accordingly uh, let's say taking up a backup or doing any sorts of upgrade patches aws will do it in that defined window so that comes from an automation or automatic purpose similarly you can write different apis in boto3 which is python or in any other language via which also you can manually backup manually backup the difference between automated and manually backup is automated backup is more incremental in nature what i mean is every time it will only take a, a backup or take a snapshot of the new changes not the old changes in case of manual it is going to take the entire changes like it it not going to be an incremental in fashion if let's say if you have already took a backup of one database for 1000 records tomorrow you add 100 more so let's say the next day when you are running the manual one it will take the entire 1100 again it's not going to focus only on the new 100 whereas automated will only focus on the new 100 so that's a difference between automated and manual again uh, which one to choose which one to not it's completely depends on the severity of your application i have seen uh, relying completely on automated backup also as well as i have also seen or i have also personally been written scripts where manuals are important i would say manual is becomes very key when you are working in very severe or critical mission critical application 
and where you need to back up your database every hour and a half in that case is manual works well if it is once in a day kind of a frequency then backup can make sense automated backup can make sense so that's i would say uh, around the backups but that also in case of if you see automated backups have been easily taken care by aws itself you don't have to do anything so that's how aws provides rds service and it simplifies your entire operational your entire other strategy by providing the seamless experience there next we'll go through amazon athena so in case of amazon athena right amazon athena is more like a serverless interactive services that's again is a very beautiful uh, i would say service and very renowned in the market along with lambda uh, the thing why it is very beautiful is it's split like in case of uh, your database like all of the people would have some experience in your database right how exactly in database works uh, the way you query i mean the database engine helps you to query the data whereas the database the data where you are querying is tightly stored into one package let's say for what i mean is uh, you are working in a sql server so your data is also stored in the database of sql server as well as your query engine is also sitting on the same machine and then you are querying so it's a tight package athena what it does it split the storage and compute right we'll also learn in this same concept in redshift it split the storage and the compute your storage is nothing but the s3 bucket so we have learned in the last lecture right it is the entire data gets stored into s3 bucket the beauty is highly scalable you are not being charged more it's very cheap right those kinds of all advantages you get while working on athena whereas you only pay for the querying of data in athena so the compute is the athena service which help you to interact on the data on s3 and you only pay for 5 dollars 1 terabyte of data that's what you pay neither you configure any sorts of database neither you do anything like in the previous slide where we talk about uh, you do still you have to launch a service you have to create database you have to create user secure it ensure all the ports are in close and all other stuff which will look into below slide also in athena since it is serverless as i mentioned in the previous slide also serverless is nothing but cloud native aws takes care of everything you just have to only look forward is your data is in right format you know about your data it's very important by the statement that you know about your data i'll explain you why and you know what kind of query you need to find if you know these three things it's pretty all set you can even use aws console itself as a query uh, editor kind of a thing you can write query play around with it and it's based on presto engine so underneath athena is a service athena service use presto as a engine like for example if you're working on mysql you have mysql as a database engine similarly in athena presto is an engine which is a distributed sql and can support variety of different data formats so different types of data formats it supports is csv json avro parquet orc right i'll tell you i think csv and json is pretty common you guys would be knowing avro parquet and orc is a more standard approach uh, or more compressed format which is widely used in a big data industry uh, it's very important also that you use the right data format as i was talking about you should know about your data is one of the experience i like to share from my uh, entire professional career is what someone has already done on uh, one of my clients side was around they had just dumped that csv data on top of it and as i mentioned that it's a 5 dollar per terabytes around it so what drawback that happened is they keep finding the frequent query and they got charged 100 dollars in one day so now what turned out is they started thinking like okay hey no athena is not the right service but it was not that the case athena still works in exact what they were looking out the right service for their the only problem was first they don't even know like they were select doing a select star they don't even know what column they need to extract that's the bad thing two they were having a direct data in a raw format in csv so one of the important thing you need to worry about in uh, athena you have to take care as a best practice or cost optimization your data needs to be compressed your data needs to be partitioned because compressed and more partition means that you're going to only scan the required data and it's all about the game of how much gb or how much data you scan so let's say the same 1 gb or 10 gb of data you compress it you partition it and if you're only scanning 500 kb you can only pay the charge of 500 kb versus if you're not compressing you're not partitioning and you're just storing your data in a csv format for 1 gb you have to pay for same data 1 gb what output you're going to get so it's very important athena is not at all a wrong service it just at how you store your data and if you don't understand the data then you have to pay the cost for it right so that's what i was mentioning that you need to understand your data very well you need to have a proper compression and partitioning of that data 
to not only reduce the cost but also increase the performance right the more the lesser you scan your data the faster you get the performance also so those are the things you need to take care when you're working with athena and the pricing perspective i think i've already opened up the key point that it's going to charge uh, i mean the first athena charges is per query or uh, the number of gbs of or terabytes of data what you scan the bare minimum it is you consider as a 10 mb like any query which you fire let's say even if it takes like 1 mb you have to pay a bill of 10 mb so it's a bare minimum you have to consider as a 10 mb which is also still okay uh five dollars per terabyte of scan so you can understand why 10 mb is okay compression and partitioning reduce the amount of data gets scanned so as i mentioned the example of 100 gb if you compress it and if it is 1 gb you only pay for that 1 gb no charges for failed queries if let's say failed queries that doesn't mean uh logical failures if something it athena is not able to support it and it got failed or it get hang up then in those queries uh, athena will not charge it let's say if there is any sort of logical error that data does not exist table does not exist in that case you will be charged so do remember that and as i mentioned athena directly queries on amazon s3 so along with this 5 terabytes uh, $5 per terabyte you also have to pay the s3 storage cost which we already know in the last lecture it's very cheap so we don't have to worry but do remember that along with this $5 you also have to pay the storage cost of s3 so that's about athena next a very wonderful service pretty in and out i do work on this one is redshift redshift uh, is a warehouse service on the cloud cloud warehouse service very renowned in the market uh, when you talk about any enterprise uh, data platform on aws you will see redshift coming out very well in that service so redshift behind the scene works on a i mean postgres engine so what if you take if you talk about any postgres database if you take that database that's exact database aws has took over that database it's an open source so it, they took the uh, entire postgres database add some more functionality optimize it scaled it out that it can where support like a warehouse kinds of an offering now what exactly the difference between a database and a warehouse database is more kind of a uh, first from your perspective it's more limited uh, storage like if you have 100 gbs of data it can store well but let's say you think that you you are working in amazon dot in where you have terabytes and petabytes of data very easily on weekly basis i would say their database will not help you because of the scale of the volume their redshift will help you a lot second the kind of business application let's say for example uh, in case of databases let's say any database you talk about sql server or mysql or postgres sql if you're talking about let's say i want to what you're going to do is they are transactional in nature oltp online transactional processing so what you're going to process is very select statement update not very complex analytical queries like for example very simple of it give me all my customers who has ordered iphone uh, in mumbai region those kinds of comp and with age let's say between uh, 15 to 20 or 20 to 25 those kinds of complex query you will not able to get into uh, the kind of in oldb whereas redshift is more into ola online or uh, analytical processing so there you may able to do different slicing dicing those kinds of complex analytical queries so that's why warehouse differs a bit when it comes to the databases in terms of the scale and the kind of the functionality you need and then redshift consists of we are also the same story what we have done in rds is the same thing in warehouse if you talk about any traditional warehouse right teradata uh, ibm db2 is there or there are other uh, netiza those are the complex or uh, products or proprietary warehouse you have on the on prem side it becomes very difficult to set that up they have the performance and the app business application is very good but it's very difficult to set that up patch maintain those are the standard thing when you do i mean it's not respect to that product as such but those are the standard thing because you all this application you install on those vms on your on prem servers or on your laptops so you need to ensure that you have to take care of your laptop this not thing specific to those products i would say uh, so but in case of redshift since it is deployed on the cloud the things get simplified when it comes to the operational part of it which includes setting up of it uh, lay down the cluster uh, cluster setup of redshift or the operate uh, operating applying patches backup monitoring those are very simplified because of the nature that you are deploying on the cloud and uh, the cluster of redshift is broken down into two things when you talk about cluster always do remember anyone talks about cluster there that two things comes of master and a slave the name differs they will have some different name for master and different name for slaves 
but when anyone talks about cluster it's always going to be the master slave concept so in case of uh, cluster in redshift cluster the master node is called a leader node and the slave node are called as a compute node so leader is something who tells compute you go and do this this is kind of a processing take that data and do this kinds of processing so that's a leader node and the compute node and that it's very important that the type of compute node you decide the type and the number you decide it's purely depend on the number of the on the storage i mean the size of the data what you're storing the number of queries you will be executing and the query execution let's say you have 1 petabytes of data or 100 terabytes of data what you have and you have let's say around hundreds of users that going to fire the data across the data set and the queries are also very complex then accordingly you need to scale out your redshift and i say scale out doesn't mean uh, automatically manually doing it around but you, the kind of compute node which you're going to select it should be higher in nature you have to configure the number of compute node very well so that's you need to take care let's say if you have only one lander one compute the performance is not going to be what you are looking for so those kinds of small small things you need to take care around it for sure aws has come up with new other uh, class like how we have studied in ec2 instance the different class of servers similarly in redshift also you have different class of it uh, dc ds ra3 or uh, aqua those kinds of different offerings redshift has come up we don't have to worry about in this particular uh, certification in detail but if you really if you want to understand this in detail from your enterprise perspective please go to the documentation where you will understand this different offering of redshift and according to your requirements and uh, as i mentioned the size of data the number of queries and the query execution performance you can select those offerings the features of amazon redshift are uh, it supports vpc uh, that simple means that you can deploy your redshift within vpc which is very important because you need to secure your data encryption at rest uh, encryption in transit scalable and cost effective for sure uh, when it comes to any data services irrespective of any data services what you are leveraging do ensure you need to launch in vpc you need to apply the security at rest and security at transit if you are working any with compliance as i mentioned last time also compliance is like uh, you are working with any regulatory data any financial any healthcare kind of a data then you need to apply those uh, vpcs as well as encryption and security by default that is i mean customer is not going to tell you by default they will assume that you know it and you have to take care of that stuff and encryption at rest and transit i have personally i know that i have configured that on an on prem server it is really difficult and pain you have to get the certificate you need to ensure to rotate and all but in case of aws it's a like configuration you just have to enable you need to provide the kms in case of rest and it all takes care of it so that's as simple as doing encryption at rest which simplifies much more over it on top of you same if in case of vpc right uh we'll understand what exactly is vpc in upcoming slides but just assume that it's like a networking uh service so in case of vpc also you just have to select from the drop down from 15 vpc i need this one and it takes care of all those stuff so it simplifies the entire operational part of it scalable i think we already understood about uh how to decide and scale it and cost effective is also there how it is cost effective is you can stop you can start whenever you need so that's why you can also have that flavor of stopping and starting and you can get it cost effective very simple let's say you know that no one is going to interact with your warehouse during the weekends during the public holidays or during certain off times let's say out of business hours there you can stop the cluster you can start it again in your working hours so those kinds of things what you can do to reduce the cost further and there are other technical so like reserving the uh, redshift cluster or doing some other things that can also give you more cost effective backup the same thing what you have learned for rds the same story goes here uh, there are two types of backup automated and manual uh, the same thing what you can uh, copy paste here cost optimization as i have spoken in the previous point also on demand pricing redshift spectrum concurrent scaling pricing and reserve instance on demand same what you have ec2 whenever no commitment whenever you want to come i mean i have given this best uh, understanding of on demand pricing and reserve pricing in my ec2 section in the previous session with an example you can refer that out on demand pricing is nothing but uh, very simple of a if i recap you book an ola cab or any sorts of cab whenever you want to drive it you just book it pay for it and drive the location that's on demand no commitment whereas reserve is purchasing your own car and keeping in parking you are making a commitment you are making an investment and then it's on you that investment can be of one year three year and five year in case of aws but you are making a fixed reserve and if you are using it not using it you have already paid for it so 
there are different slabs in your reserve instance also pay upfront pay 50% pay no upfront those kinds of different things are there and accordingly also you get more discount on top of it but just assume that you are getting a uh, car in your entire in your uh, parking and then that's a reserve instance redshift spectrum and concurrent scaling are two very specific feature in terms of redshift as i was talking about in athena right that uh, athena splits storage and compute similarly in redshift also there is a functionality called as redshift spectrum spectrum is an extended capability of redshift where what it does is it leverage the redshift cluster as a compute s3 as a storage and you can query any data which is sitting in s3 same what we had in athena same what you can do in redshift also with redshift spectrum so it split the storage and the compute so this way you are not paying for any sorts of higher storage you are only paying for the compute that also can help you from a cost perspective concurrent scaling pricing so concurrent scaling pricing is something you can have different functionalities like wlm and those kinds of stuff where you can concurrently scale uh based on their need and then you can automatically have some best practices scale down and scale up kind of a stuff based on the concurrent around it so that's about redshift the different uh understanding about it and different uh, other details around this next very interesting service dynamo db uh dynamo db is more of a key value kind of a stuff key value and document database if i simple put it out uh dynamo db is a no sql in nature i'll there's a next slide which will talk about what's the difference between sql and no sql just understand for now that dynamo db is no sql in nature uh it's much more optimized uh it's much more very fast so so far what we have understand uh in case of rds also it's fast it reduces the uh, offering and uh, i mean operational part and all of this stuff just assume copy paste it here the same follows for dynamo db also but dynamo db is way above than first dynamo db is a managed offering so when i say managed as i mentioned in serverless in case of lambda also right same goes here managed offering aws takes care of spinning up dynamo db you don't have to do anything it's more like a serverless you just create the table and start writing your code to insert the data into the table right that's what you have to do after selecting the right primary key indexes and all of the stuff that's more around the configuration part but you don't have to spin up anything or do any sorts of maintenance or those kind of scalability and all it's highly scalable the latency is, is almost in milliseconds latency is like you fire a query and the response you get the data it's very fast it's in milliseconds if you have right configuration done in terms of the primary key and indexes it's very fast so that's one about it uh, second it has built in security same via iam you can secure it you can insure it there's a backup and restore and as well as in memory cache from internet application perspective so dynamo a uh, dynamo db has a offering called as dex dex is like an accelerator that accelerator is also like a caching on top of dynamo db so let's say if you already have a uh, fire a query and you have a response next time first it will go against that cache before going and hitting the actual table in dynamo so that's the caching so that's why you get more faster response time uh, i think the point to is mentioned that it can handle up to 10 trillion requests per day can support pick of 20 million per second that shows how much scalable it is and how much fast it is the important point is here about the primary key i think this term is very important uh, for everyone we you seen in a relational rds also relational rdbms or if you see no sql primary key is used to uniquely identify in case of dynamo db uh, there are two ways primary key hash key primary key in case of dynamo db if you understand it very well will help to determine the physical location of the data composite key is a like a primary key plus sort key for example a uh, very simple example if i put it out live here is primary key is something like mumbai i am my physical location i am based out of mumbai okay so that's a primary key but now primary key is i mean mumbai is a big city where in mumbai exactly are you located so that let's say primary key becomes your mumbai hash key and sort key is something like a range now range can be okay you belong let's say from one station to second station or second to third or fourth so this way what happens is you get more faster very precise location that okay in mumbai in this particular station from station a to b this guy resides so that's what you next time when you're querying the data you're going to add mumbai plus station a and b that will help you to look up the location of that person not that you're scanning the entire all the stations of mumbai so that's how the difference here is do you remember that this example this will help you long time when you are working in dynamo db it's really important that you select the right partition key 
and sort key. If you don't select the right partition and sort key, the performance is going to be very bad. I mean, it's going to be worse. The cost is going to be higher. So please ensure that that you understand that and go through this example as well as other examples mentioned in the documentation. Partition or indexes. Uh, indexes, if we talk about, uh, we have understood in relational database also, you create index, uh, indexes to look up. Indexes in simple, the person, I mean, the people who don't know, it's more like your, in case of any book, you would have read any book. In the book, you have an index. In the index, the best part of index is any topic which you're looking out, there's a page number. Let's say if you have a 500 page book, you're not going to go page by page. I mean, you can go ahead for sure, but it's going to be more time consuming to look up your any particular topic. Whereas if you look at the index, you can identify, okay, this topic belongs to page number 490 and you directly jump on 490. So that's how you effectively scan the data. Similarly in uh, DynamoDB also, uh, there, is uh, there is secondary index, which has been there. Uh, secondary index allows you to perform queries on attribute that are not part of the table's primary key. So that's a not part of the table's primary key. Let's say, for example, as I mentioned, the location and particular city, they are not, they are into the primary key. So any attribute outside to that, maybe let's say zip code, for an example, that's not part of my primary key. Based on zip code also, you can look as a secondary index. And in case of secondary index, there are two other offerings, LSI, local secondary index and global secondary index. Uh, local secondary index, just remember that it has the same partition key, what you have selected in the primary key, but a different sort key different sort key and you can not i mean you can only create it while creating the table in dynamodb once you create the table then you cannot create it the second difference in case of global secondary indexes you have a different completely different partition key completely different sort key and can be created while creating the table or even after creating the table you can add it remove modify you can do anything so do remember that the biggest difference between lsi and gsi and here I'll just try to draw the attention on the right side of image, the same thing, like how exactly the records are stored. Like you have, this are called this item. So in normal thing, what we call as a row in all the relational databases, in DynamoDB, those are called as items. This is a table and the partition and sort key, which we understood in the composite and other sections. Now the important thing, I would say the important section is SQL versus no SQL. So we understood in the previous slide, we have gone through MySQL, SQL Server and those things, whereas we also gone through DynamoDB. The difference between SQL Server is you have to follow in a tabular format, rows and a column. So as you see here, product one, two, three, and you have a very structured tabular format, very fixed table that you have same number of columns across all the rows, right? And then you can have a parent child based on the primary and foreign key kind of concepts. You guys know better than me, all those things. That's relational. That's how it calls a relational database. Relational is nothing but a table. Other end, if you see on the right side, the NoSQL part of it, right? One simple observation is it doesn't make necessary that all the rows should have the same number of the columns. Very simple of it. So there is no structure on it. Like the structure is like the partition sort key. After that, the attributes, what you have, there is no requirement on attributes. If you have to define the partition key and the sort key, and here you can have on the attribute side, you can have 10 columns. Even you can have one column based on the requirement of that particular row. So that's the difference between SQL and a NoSQL outside the indexes, the terminology part of it, like in case of uh, relational, everything is called as columns. Uh, in case of NoSQL, there's a different way around it. Uh, it's, I mean, uh, no SQL, you don't even have like a parent child kind of a relation, how you have like a for primary foreign key kind of a thing in relational. Those are the other details what you have. There are other kinds of uh, distinguish or the com a difference you have. SQL is no SQL, which you can deep dive. But for a simple understanding, SQL is more relational, more fixed tabular structure. No SQL gives you very flexibility there. Uh, the lookup is faster and all of this stuff. So do remember that difference. No one is going to ask you an exam, but this is a fundamental thing which you should remember. So here we end uh, the first section, which was around the serverless part of it. And as well as database, I'll take a pause and I'll go through it. Be any sorts of questions, what you have. Okay, I think we have a uh, more number of questions. Okay. Uh, So I think the Lambda function, uh, I think all, I already mentioned it's more like a serverless services. 
where uh, you only have to be responsible about writing the functions and you don't have to worry about configuring anything like if you simply compare lambda and ec2 in ec2 you have to deploy you have to security groups you have to attach all other stuff like authentication keys and all lambda simplifies that so it's more like a function as a service kind of an offering uh, so that's about it what is event driven architecture so i think i've already explained what is event driven architecture there like you there is certain change in the uh, state and based on that the lambda is trigger and lambda performs certain action which gets saved at the output end so that's more of an event driven the next question we have is lambda is automated version of ec2 which lets run our code okay so that's the next name can we run heavy applications like instagram uh, etc in serverless so as i mentioned right uh, you need to be very cautious when you are designing the kind of the applications uh, most of the cases i would say first of all no you cannot run the instagram direct application here and for your understanding also i won't take much time but instagram is not the entire one shot application instagram is also broken down with a couple of other microservices or a rest web services so let's say when you like when you reshare or when you upload something there is a particular api in the back end that takes care of each and every functionality so each functionality can be hosted in lambda the entire instagram is not a one single package which you host anywhere i mean not even on ec2 instance that is there that acts as a monolithic architecture and the new era technologies or application are built at the microservices in nature how we can migrate our on prem databases to aws uh, that's a very good question srishti so uh, there are multiple ways are available for doing that right in aws itself there are services like uh, glue is there which we'll talk about in later aws is a very specific very beautiful service which is database migration service uh, dms what we refer as this out of this particular uh, exam i'm saying but dms is the right service where you can do the same thing without writing any much more complex code you can migrate your on prem to the uh, my on prem database to the aws as well as let's say you are a, i mean you don't want to rely on aws services you have to write your own custom code then you can use something like scoop or spark those kinds of programmatical way also to migrate the database in a native fashion there are other proprietary tools are also available in the market like informatica and other stuff but very simple there are multiple ways to do it uh, based on how exactly you look forward and a uh, database migration service offered by aws is a native and a standard way of doing that which database type can be stored video content okay uh, that's a very good question video content so first of all uh, do remember that we you never directly store any sorts of video content in the database first thing ever what you do is you store the video exact video blob in s3 or any storage content and the link the reference link of that video gets stored into database whether you use sql server or whether you use dynamo db i mean no sql irrespective of that the actual video stores in s3 and the reference link gets stored if i talk about aws if i talk about any uh, video streaming kind of a platform dynamo db makes much more sense because of the latency part of it the latencies are milli milliseconds so that ensure that you stream your video very well uh, how we can migrate on premise database to the cloud or vice versa uh, i think no one is going to do the reverse of it from the cloud to uh, a, or your on prem but again as i mentioned database migration service is one of them things like scoop uh, those are the other techniques what you can use to in terms of the migration sql mirroring okay sql mirroring is a very complex i mean i will say internally from a sql server perspective it's a uh, process where you mirror so in case of different uh, technology you have like grade zero and those kinds of offering what you have right from a drive perspective similarly in case of sql server sql server automatically do does the mirroring part of it that it mirrors the copy the replica of its existing live cluster to another mirrors out or creates a replica that on a high level is called a sql server mirroring kind of thing which property we need to keep in mind while selecting a database like from aurora and athena uh that's a very good question again which property you need to keep take care of when it comes to uh, selecting the database right it's completely depends okay uh, if i tell uh, let's say your data is going to be always in s3 then it makes sense that you can use things like redshift spectrum athena based on the kind of operational what you need like let's say for example you have terabytes hundreds and petab hundreds terabytes and petabytes of data 
then Redshift makes sense. Redshift spectrum, because that's a warehouse kind of a thing. If it is more, let's say, a couple of GBs or a few hundreds of GBs of data, then you can use Athena. And if data is going to be always on S3. So that's why you can look forward to Athena or Redshift spectrum. Let's say you have certain kind of a structured relational kind of a look of what you need to do, which you want to partition, you want to edit, you want to play around it. Then Aurora makes sense, right? Aurora, MySQL, or any sorts of RDS offering makes sense. Where let's say you want to do any sorts of update operation also. Uh, you not only just have to uh, select, but even you have to make insert, update, delete. There, Aurora, any sorts of curd operation, what we call, then Aurora or any RDS service will make sense. So this is how, based on the type of application, you can select where you want to go with uh, RDA service or you want to go with Aurora or, uh, I mean, sorry, Athena or Redshift Spectrum. I think we can use MongoDB for storing video content, but we can store our video in a particular file directory and reference the URL that, of that particular file in our database. Exactly. So what you mentioned is the same concept on the cloud, right? So what you mentioned about the MongoDB, MongoDB, if you go to the basics, the document DB, like we spoke about the NoSQL, which was a key slash value kind of a thing. MongoDB is a document DB. So you can store the document DB in a particular for a uh, particular folder, and then you can paste the reference of it. Now that folder, if I, if I, Take, uh, take the concept of AWS, that folder is nothing but your storage. The storage is S3 and that location, the folder location, what you're adding in MongoDB is the reference link. That's what I said, the S3 reference link is what you store and that particular folder is nothing but the S3. Okay, so that's one. What is the exact use of Snowball? Uh, that's a, again a question. Let's say for example, uh, you're working in any form. Uh, let's say MDNL for an example, or any any form which has terabytes, terabytes, petabytes of data. Now, think petabytes is even thousand terabytes of data. So you have ten petabytes of data. Now, how many years I would say you are going to take to transfer that data? Internet speed, uh, the kind of upload download you need, the other factors, right? You cannot joke your entire internet what you have for this and just the transfer. And again, the time, the time is also very important. Their snowball is like a physical tape, uh, pen drives, right? How you have a pen drive. Now, if I tell you, hey, you can transfer the data from network to network also. You will, you understand that pain, right? It's going to ensure the network speed, uh, the upload download speed, what we have generally, those things will come up. Whereas pen drive is very faster. You just plug your pen drive, transfer the data, copy the pen drive, take that pen drive, transfer it and down. That's much more faster, right? Similarly, just think that exact scenario as a snowball. Snowball is a physical device. You transfer all your data, whether it's terabytes, petabytes, transfer that, put it into Snowball and ship that physical device to AWS. AWS will transfer that data into S3. The entire route of ordering a Snowball, transferring it and shipping it back will take somewhere around two to three weeks. So in two to three weeks, without putting any constraint on your network, any data transfer, you securely transfer your data into S3. Again, to ensure, when you are sending or transferring your data, you are transferring your data on an internet speed, which is a public. In case of Snowball, it's completely private. The snowball is between your physical device to Snowball physical device. And when AWS most you send this back to AWS, it's again between the physical device of Snowball and the AWS physical device, which acts as a S3 backend. So that's an exact use case of S3. Does Redshift cost expensive? Is there any alternate data warehouse service which is less expensive than Redshift? I haven't heard about Redshift Spectrum. Uh, spectrum cost optimization. Please tell me more. Okay, uh, that's a very good thing, right? So let me take a step back on Redshift around the cost exp uh, cost expensive part of it. There are other other products available in the market where if you feel that Redshift first of all is not experience uh, expensive when you use in a proper warehouse. Uh, if you see, if you compare, let's say, a warehouse system which is running for six months. With a proper warehouse, when I say warehouse is like 100 GBs of data, there is a huge database, uh, user chunk, what you're using and all. When you compare Redshift and other things, there are other proprietary softwares that are available in the market. If you compare the performance, the cost of Redshift and all those things, Redshift takes a step ahead on that one. That's one. Two, uh, when it comes to what you have mentioned about the Redshift spectrum cost. The Redshift Spectrum cost, you haven't heard about it because generally we don't do this kinds of stuff. But if you go back to the traditional uh, air, traditional database engineering, there is always something called as a cold and a warm storage. What that means is anything warm, which is like live data where you need, keep frequently firing the data and all, 
that you always have in a warm storage, which is your Redshift cluster. Anything which is cold, let's say cold is something what you will use it if you require, and if you require, then you will require it very spontaneously. That access is cold. Cold data you can already store into the S3. Now, as you mentioned correctly, this is not one of the thing as a part of the cost expensive like optimization. But if you understand it in a detail, the storage cost of Redshift get optimized because the entire data is sitting in S3, which is very cost effective compared to the Redshift storage cost. So that's how it comes in a cost optimization perspective. That anything, if you understand your data, you know that here are a couple GBs of data. I'm not going to use it, but still, in case one find if I need it, I just shift the data into S3 so I can query as a form of a cold storage via Spectrum. And there you take care of it. And anyways, Spectrum doesn't need anything else outside your Redshift cluster. And you only charge the same like Athena, one terabytes for, uh, sorry, $5 for one terabytes. So there you're not paying any cost, even though storing your data into Redshift storage. So that's how it's one of the cost optimization techniques. Uh, how we can use AWS Greengrass IoT? I will answer this question later on, on this perspective. Please explain encryption in transit term. Okay. So there are two terms when it comes to encryption. Uh, one is the encryption at rest. Second is encryption in transit. Okay. Encryption at rest is anything which is at rest, which is sitting in a hard disk, not moving here and there in simple terms, which is called as at rest. Anything which is moving across, let's say from one computer to another computer, one network to another network that is in transit in movable format. Encryption at rest is you can use things like AES 256 and those kinds of encryption algorithms. KMS is also uses that same security standard to do it. Encryption in transit, when you're moving the data, you also need to ensure that when you're moving, no one, that data is very secure between the movement or between the transit. So that is called as encryption in transit. Why we use NoSQL databases? Okay, why we use NoSQL databases? Let's say, for example, you're working on an e-commerce kind of uh, stuff, Amazon.in, right? To be sure, every customer will have a different choice, different product. Some may order 10 quantity, some may order 20 quantity, some may have a different way, right? Where there is no fixed standard of it. That's one. Two, you need a very faster way or reduce latency kind of a response there. Three, the application or the catalog changes, right? So those are the couple of uh, inputs where you can use the snowball uh, kind of a concept, a snow, sorry, no SQL, no SQL kind of a database around that stuff, where you know very well that you are going to break the requirement property, asset pro, uh, relational as well as asset property, which is required to make any database as a relational database. When you're not going to follow those properties, there exactly you need no SQL kind of a stuff. Like very simple of it, there in case of e-commerce website, there might be various other ways where 10 other people will be trying to access the same device at the same time. Let's say for example, iPhone 13, talk of the town, is going to launch very soon in October. There are hundreds, not hundred, I will say very easily, one lakh about that people will be looking that same. Some might be doing window shopping, some might be going actually purchasing it, but that's the same device all the people trying to access it. So there you need to capture each of that metadata and the metadata will change as per from customer to a customer. The window shopping may have a different metadata versus the actual customer may have a different metadata. So there you need a kind of a flexibility to come up that traditional way of storing everything in a fixed format. Can we use Snowball for migrating our database to the cloud? Uh, Snowball is more, I would say, uh, yes, first of all, you can do that. What, how you can do it, you can take the dump. So if you talk about SQL or anything, you can download the dump of that. You can move that dump from uh, from your physical device to Snowball and then that dump sits in S3 and you can restore it back. That's a way for sure you can do it, okay? But Snowball widely I've seen across industry is more from an object-based perspective. When I say object is more perspective, like any sorts of file, any sorts of video content, like personally, in my, one of my use cases also, we have moved around terabytes, like there was around 10 or 15 terabytes of documents, compliance documents that were sitting on-prem and we want to do some processing. There we use Snowball to move that data to the cloud. So any sorts of files, object-based kind of stuff works very well. But again, as I mentioned, you can take the dump of your database, extract the database, and then you do it. But there is an overhead of doing that. So do remember about it. Uh, is there any importance of learning web development as a cloud engineer? Uh, I think I'll answer, try to answer this question in detail at the end, but uh, I would say no, first of all, I am not a web developer. I'm a pure DevSecOps guy. I know how to work on cloud engineering. 
I love to code as a Python. I don't know Node.js or React.js, that kind of stuff. So it's not important, I would say. It's always important that uh, you should be knowing one programming language. And the best part, if you see so far in all the three sessions of my AWS is AWS provide different way of doing uh, or working on CLI. They provide SDK and CLI, which you can work across all the services, right? So let's say worst case scenario, you're not a web developer. You are just a person who knows shell program. Still, you can work with CLI. You are a person who just know Python like me. You can work with SDK. So I don't say you need to be a web developer as a, a web development as a cloud engineering, right? Again, uh, it's always good to learn new things from a market or a skill perspective. But I would say that's not at all a prerequisite to learn web development for working on AWS. Hope I was able to answer your question. That's really interesting questions, I think, guys. And for sure, yes, I'll get back to you your answer about green grass at the end of the session because there's a completely different topic. So I'll get back to you on that. Okay, so this is a question not regarding to the context. To be very, to be a cloud support associate, do we need very good uh, competitive programming? Second one, com programming is enough for working on AWS, okay? Exactly, so I think Shiti, what you have mentioned, Shishti, the same thing what I mentioned, right? Uh, cloud support, Associate, I think cloud support associate, I think is more like a job profile, which differs. I'm not talking about that perspective, right? I'm more talking about as a kind of a person, cloud engineer working on AWS as a platform. There, you need to be good with one programming language. Every, I mean, if you're looking from a job perspective, that depends on what kind of job you're looking for, right? If you're looking as a cloud engineer or cloud associate uh, support engineer, always in all the job description, they will call out, you should be good with one programming language. That's a bare minimum every company one. but now if you apply for it's a software engineer i mean in aws itself there is a sd software development engineer is there software engineer is there across different companies the kind of role what you select the kind of uh, job where you apply that depends very heavily if you apply for let's say full stack developer for sure you're going to be expected to be knowing one of the front end of programming language but if you apply for let's say any sorts of uh, python any sorts of cloud engineer any sorts of uh, cloud support engineer any sorts of devops engineer we are not expecting you to be knowing ReactJS. If you know, that's a good advantage, but they will be expecting you Python and Bash scripting because personally, I do also do interviews for my client, for my company. I will always look that the person should be good with one programming language, which can be Bash, Shell programming, Python programming, Ruby, Go, Java, anything. But one programming, you should be in and out, thorough with that. Cool, so I, looking at the time, I'll jump to the next section, please feel free to post your questions. I'm very happy to see all these questions coming out and I'll keep answering that post the next section. So let me jump to the glue. I think someone asked me that how you can migrate around from on-prem to the cloud and that's the right time. So glue, glue again, one more offering under serverless banner. It's a fully managed, as I mentioned the term fully managed ETL. It's a serverless service, which is providing you the ETL. So any uh, data engineers, when you're working around, right? Uh, you know the ETL, you extract the data, you transform and you load it. That kind of ETL, if you want to do, then Glue works well. The best part of working on Glue is the same thing. You don't have to manage about server, server you don't have to manage about the compute, all of the, those kinds of stuff. Sorry, give me one minute. So yeah, I think it's fully managed ETL. So it's like more like a serverless. You don't have to worry about anything. You just have to write your code. And again, in Glue, uh, it provides both the, I mean, underneath it provides two offerings. One is a Python. Like if you, let's say, as I mentioned, if you have a good Python or a Scala, you can write as a pure Python or Scala job, or you can write into a big data like a Spark. So Spark is a big data technology distributed processing capability. Uh, you can just detail, in detail, if you want to learn and explore big data domain, then you can uh, look up on internet Apache Spark. Uh, it's a very distributed processing framework and very detailed uh, discussion what we what is there. If you if you want to write Spark again, you can write PySpark or Scala Spark in Glue. So if you are uh, looking forward from a normal traditional ETL or if you are doing any big data processing, it, uh, Glue supports both those kinds of operations. Again, serverless. Three things you need to uh, look forward is flexible, uh, ease of use, 
and cost effective these are the three terms uh, how glue has been leveraged like simple as i mentioned you don't have to worry about any servers and other stuff like say for example you're writing a python code and you're deploying the python code on an ec2 instance you need to take care about you need to worry about it that okay how my code is running whether my process is killed or not whether i have proper logging and not those kinds of things you have to take care and also on top of it the scaling part the cost part and everything in glue you don't have to do anything else the logs get printed on the cloud watch you just have to ensure that you write the code and logically from a business processing perspective it's working fine and rest it takes care aws takes care of everything so it's simple cost effective and it's flexible to use flexible in terms of there are certain uh, data processing unit dpu so you have to select the dpu like i have one i i mean this particular job needs one dpu two dpu four dpu dpu is nothing but the data processing unit or more in a simpler term i would say compute capability that's required for this job to run similarly aws will configure and it will take care automatically so that's about the functionality perspective as i mentioned along with that how it works right uh, this is a very a bit of complex or advanced concept that comes up is metadata metadata is nothing but data about data in simple i know it's a very funny thing a uh, data about data so glue consists of central metadata repository called as glue data catalog now for example what that means metadata uh, you have the entire data stored in s3 okay now still if you want to look up something that okay uh, my students enrollment file is stored at which location then what you do is you have that kind of a tracking again stored in some database or glue data catalog so that's what is the metadata right your data actual data is in s3 and the data about data which can be anything the size the owner the reference location anything which is called as a metadata again stored into a database so that's a data about data so glue also provides things like glue catalog there are new things which has come up in last few months uh, in glue right uh, so we have seen in the industry also many people knows very well about their business logic but they don't know things like spark they don't know things like python right but does that mean that they they, they cannot do or write a job in glue right that's not the case aws has come up with glue studio glue studio is more like a drag and drop kind of a functionality where you can write or you can just drag and drop and automatically behind the scene uh, the code get generated in the spark and you do don't have to worry about it you have to just select okay where is my s3 location where is my database it is and automatically aws will take care all of the stuff and it take care of all other uh, things around scheduling and everything around part of it and as i mentioned about the stuff that automatically generates a python and scala code and flexible scheduler <laughs> scheduler is more like a kind of an automatic trigger which you want to be there like for example uh, if i simply uh, one example if i give is let's say you are getting a data from different uh, sources the sources or from one place one system the system is uploading that job at uh, i mean uploading the data dump at let's say 2 am in the morning now you cannot be awake at 2 am in the morning you can do it like for one week two week but not every day so what you can do is you can have a glue scheduler that as soon as the data comes into the bucket there is a glue scheduler i mean the data catalog can refresh the glue scheduler can run that so this way what it does is glue scheduler can the, the run the job the etl job and etl job can look forward the refresh metadata which is stored in glue data catalog and it can do all the processing so if you refer this architecture let's say you have a data source you have a crawler crawler can identify any new changes in the source and refresh the glue, glue data catalog which is the metadata part of the entire data and then this is a at the bottom you see the different etl job right the source where you extract transform can be any cleansing activity any processing activity what you do in data which varies from business use case and then finally you load the data into target so i think one example which you mentioned can i migrate from my on prem to the cloud this is what you can leverage you can have this data source can be anywhere aid any aws services to any on prem unless glue can reach out to that service that's one i mean from a networking perspective it extracts the data it cleanses the data and it can store to any data now this target can also be your on prem sql server or your aws c rds services it can do anything so that's how it can uh, it that's also one of the service where you can do the migration part of it right and from a component perspective database data catalog and etl so do remember i think we have spoken about this in the previous context also database consists of tables obvious and connection that's also obvious tables is nothing but the tables 
and the connection, which I mentioned the network connection part of it. Data catalog consists of crawlers and classifiers. So crawlers, data catalog needs to crawl the data, classifies, classifying and filtering and doing those all. So that's classifier. ETL consists of jobs, these entire jobs and the triggers. Triggers is what needs to be triggered. So this is trigger, right? So we'll go through and we'll understand in CloudWatch there is something called as event. There you can trigger your job also. So ETL consists of jobs and triggers. Database consists of tables and connections and data catalog consists of crawlers and classifiers. So that's about glue. Moving towards next, the important service, which is VPC. I think I've mentioned about VPC a lot and I'm pretty sure uh, this is a very fundamental service like how I've spoken about S3, EC2, IM in the previous session. This is going to be the next big service fundamental which will be required. So far, we have understood about AWS, right? Uh, AWS is very secure, AWS provide network flexibility and other functionalities, right? AWS, when you create any new account, right? I'm not sure whether you guys have created any accounts or not, but let's say you have your company account or you create new account. Whenever you spin up a new account, by default, AWS come up with a default VPC. First of all, VPC is like a virtual private cloud. I'll explain you what exactly that means. So default VPC, right? Default is something with less security. You can do whatever you want there. Uh, there is no much control has been there, right? How AWS does is AWS is more like a shared platform. Anyone can use that AWS services is just shared, right? But now I want to be very sure that uh, I have my own separate section in that shared network, which is very specific to my account, my services or my processing what I'm doing. There exactly you deploy a VPC, which is virtual private cloud, right? Virtual private cloud. That means virtually private fragmenting. You're fragmenting that entire AWS network for one dedicated portion for your own use case. So that it means virtual private cloud. And then what you can do? Simple thing. You can launch EC2 instance. You can plug S3 bucket. You can plug DynamoDB. You can connect that VPC with your on-prem for faster exchange of data and all. Those all things kind of do. So any one, I mean, you would have seen in your college or in your industry, in your uh, offices, right? You have that entire logical uh, network. You have of, uh, kind of a IP addresses to your laptop. You have different segregations around it, right? I mean, network topology, let's say first floor has this kind of IP address range. Second floor has this IP address range. Then there is a main server room. That is called as network design or network entire topology. What? Similarly, you can design or define that same topology in case of AWS also, like how it is mentioned on the right hand side, right? There are different components to have like subnet, internet, gateway, endpoints, VPC gateway, uh, even NECL, security groups, route table. Don't worry about it. We'll go in the next slide in detail what it component means. But similarly, these are the different components that help and allow you to define your own network. So just creating VPC will not help. Uh, VPC is like a one big umbrella, like a sub logical unit. If you see here, right? It's a sub logical unit. What you have under that VPC, you have different components to define your network topologies, which allows you to launch EC2 instance, connect with internet, connect with your uh, on-prem network. When I say on-prem, your company network, those kinds of things, what you can do with help of defining the VPCs. So do remember that about it. VPC is your own virtual private cloud. You know, your own dedicated private cloud, which you get on AWS, that's one. It's always recommended that you do not use default, which comes out of the way when you create new account, you define or create your custom VPC and leverage that because that's much more secure. You define the network topology. That's not the standard one. You define it. You can create your own public subnet, your private subnet, those kinds of things. You can create it. You can harden your security groups, your necker rules. Those kinds of things you can do. And along with that, the important thing at the bottom, you can define your own sets of IP address range, right? You would have always seen there is a set of IP address range, which are there. If you're working, let's say in this on, uh, it's a virtual setup. When you're working with any of the company, uh, they always ask you, hey, what is your IP address range? If you want to connect, right? Then you say blah, 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 192.168 point, blah, blah. You, what you find the first cider you give, right? Similarly, in AWS, also in VPC, you can define what will be the entire CIDR, the entire block of IP addresses that any device will be using within that network. So the highest what you can have is slash 16, which has 65,536 IP address. 
the smallest what you can have is slash 28, which is 16 IP address. So that's how you can ensure that, okay, how much you can take care of entire your IP address range. Please ensure neither it's going to be too big, neither it should be too small. Generally, you have to ensure that the, IP, the entire address block, what you define is very minimum. I mean, minimum and to an extent that suffices for your needs. Because if you have more IP address range, it's not going to cost you. Not, it's not from a cost perspective. There is a high volume. If something gets break, uh, the hackers can launch multiple of your EC2 instance and they can do an attacks and all of this stuff, right? But if you have very defined range of IP address, they won't even get any IP address range in your VPC to do that, right? So from reducing the launch attack. So one of the security practices that you minimize the surface of attack. So that's from that principle perspective, please define your CIDR range. That's meaningful and required as per your use case. Not too small, not too large. Somewhere middle of it based on the requirement of your use case. So that's about VPC introduction. As I mentioned, the different use cases of VPC, what you have, internet gateway, subnet. Again, internet gateway is more, you can simply, if I put it out, I'm not going to go with exact uh, theoretical statement. I'll try to make it as a real time example so you can easily connect it. And for sure, if you want to go through theoretical, you can refer the slides, but let me explain you in an example perspective. Internet gateway in a simple terms is more like your router. Uh, everyone nowadays has an internet or uh, what you have is a router. Now, how internet gateway can be directly compared to a router is once you connect to the router, then you are able to connect to the internet for you. So simple example is what you can have a router. Subnet. Subnet is something what you physically uh, or logical isolation of your network, right? Uh, in anywhere, where you're in school, colleges, or any co company, you have different departments, right? You have IT department, you have HR department, you have legal department, right? Then you have other operational or infra department. There's a logical separation they have based on their responsibilities. Similarly, in subnet is exactly the same. You log logically break down your entire network into different subnets, into different smaller chunks. That chunks can help you to define the things. Like for example, as I mentioned in RDS, as well as in case of Redshift, please ensure that you deploy this uh, any database in a private subnet. Private means that by default, no one from external can directly connect to the database. So that means that it is very secure and only the components working in VC can connect and access to it directly. So that way it's very secure. So it's private to your VPC. There are certain things like, for example, any web server, which needs to be accessed from your Chrome browser or anywhere that needs to be publicly available, right? Any website which you host needs to be accessible anywhere in the world. So that is public. So based on the functionality, the nature of the type, you can define your entire, you can broke down into VPCs into multiple of private, public kind of a subnet, and that's you can do it. Generally, how people does it, right? They have a multi-layer approach. Uh, they have like, let's say one is for web, one is for app, and one is for the database. They have three layers across multi-AZ. So each subnet can work in one availability zone. I, I hope that you guys know what is availability zone by now. Each subnet only belongs to one availability zone. It cannot stretch across two availability zones. Do remember that. So how it people does it, they break down into six subnets in any VPC. I mean, that depends on our application perspective, but generally I see six subnets. One they have for, I mean, three subnets from a business application, app, web, and database. That's a three logical in one AZ. Similarly, they have multi AZ. So they are replicated into another AZ. So totally they have six subnets for what they create. And again, that there is no as such rules that you have to create six subnets or versus all. Bare minimum, you should create two subnets, one for private, one for public. Maximum depends on your application and in your need. That's one. Uh, so as I mentioned about the private subnet, public subnet, and those kinds of stuff. Similarly, you would have also understand something called as firewall rules, right? Certain ports are not open. Uh, certain uh, websites you cannot access in your company or in your college, right? Those are banned. How those get banned? Because of the firewall rules. It's a very generic term. Similarly, in AWS, there are two things, two lines of defense what AWS provides. One is a NECL, NACL, Network Access Control List. Second is a security groups. I think security groups we refer in the EC2 sections also. NECL works on a subnet level. So any routing of traffic you want to block that, okay, let's say there should not be any traffic coming on port 25 or port 80, for an example, that you can block on a subnet level. So by default, when you block it on subnet level, it's a all server which you launch in that subnet 
have to obey that rule. So that's how you can control on one central level. And let's say you don't want to do it and you want to do it on a specific EC2 instance, you have security group, which acts as a second line of defense of control. In the security group, I mentioned you very clearly that it's a stateless. Like what you have in inbound, that doesn't mean automatically reflects as outbound. But in case of NECL is stateful, let's say you block port 80 on subnet. Similarly, that means the inbound and outbound both get blocked. It's not that it get blocked only on inbound, but it's a stateful. So it will own, it will replicate both the parts, the traffic floating in and out into the server, into the subnet versus moving out of the subnet inbound and outbound. It will applicable at both ends. So that's about subnet. The next is a routing table. Routing table is more like a, uh, generally like the people who are from a network perspective right that you you understand the allocation tables the mac table what you have where you maintain the records about it right the entire record that this mac has this ip address so any request coming around it you have to send it to this ip address and those kinds of stuff similarly in aws there is routing table now routing table is very simple if I, it's more like a structured table like you have columns and different rows in each column where you mention the subnet the different kinds of uh, servers what you have and then you map it to the route table do remember that that you can only one subnet can be mapped to only one route table like you cannot have one subnet mapped to two route tables you can have only one of them this is again the similar things right the private subnet will map to the private route table the public subnet will map to the public route table and public route table will be mapped to your routers right so similarly that kind of segregation or fra uh, fragmentation you can do with route tables also but as I was talking about that one subnet can be mapped to one route table. Do remember that route tables can have multiple subnets. Like route table consists of subnet one, two, three, four, five. There's that they can do it, but subnet one can be only attached to one route table. So do remember that kind of a relationship here. Otherwise it will be really tricky. That's route table. Net gateway. Net gateway is very uh, important thing, right? Uh, it's more how I simply transition network address translator, what we generally call as a gateway. What, as I mentioned, the uh, subnet thing, right? That if you have a private subnet, no one can directly reach out to you. Okay. But let's say, but someone can ask me that, okay, if no one can reach out to me, how you can do things like, let's say, downloading the patch, downloading any library, because I'm in sub private subnet. That means simply I also cannot access or uh, the internet gateway that's not the case in case of NAT gateway what it works is uh NAT gateway primarily will help you in case of private subnet let's say you have an ec2 instance for an example which is deployed in a private subnet now from a definition perspective we understood that uh, no one can directly reach out to you but what with help of NAT gateway you can reach out to internet what it works is let's say you have a private ip address of 172.168 let's say 0.0, .0. 0.1 that what you have an address okay your private address for say let's say and then you have, you have a net gateway IP address is 192.168.0.0 that's what you have so when you're sending a request even the request has been sent by you as 172 the external gateway the external internet will proxy that request by a 192 so net will forward that request as 192.168 IP address, not with 172. It will encapsulate or translate the network to the internet public with its own IP address on its own public IP address. Right? So this way you get secured around it. And when the response is back, let's say you're downloading a Boto3 or you're downloading Python. So EC2 sends a request to net gateway, go and download a Python. So the, the request will go to internet with 192.168. And when you're getting a response back from Python website, it will also be addressed to 192.168 where in the net gateway it has a table that if i if i get the request from this particular website it i have to send it to 172 so this is how the mapping has been done and net gateway does the translator part a boundary between the private and the public so this way no one knows behind the net what's happening and who is the one who has originated the request so that's about the net gateway Ingress only in an internet gateway. Uh, it's again the same concept what we have in internet gateway, but that only allows the outbound access. That means you or any of your servers within the VPC can access the outbound. Inbound is not allowed. That's uh, that's the only difference. In internet gateway, normal internet gateway, it's both are allowed, inbound, outbound. Egress only means only outbound. The next is an elastic IP. 
Elastic IP, as I mentioned, uh, so very simple of it. You can try this at your own also. Launch an EC2 instance. After an EC2 instance is launched, any T2 micro, any large instance also, whatever, any instance is fine. After the instance is launched and it's running, delete that instance. And again, relaunch a new instance. You will see after when you launch it second time, the public IP get changed of that instance. Now that means that whenever you launch an instance, you terminate and you relaunch, the public IP will keep changing with every new launch. But you want to be sure that due to compliance or due to let's say some other requirement, you want to have a fixed IP address. Then even though if I delete 10,000 times and I relaunch 10,000 times, I want a fixed IP address, the static IP address. So that is provided by Elastic IP. With Elastic IP, you can attach to EC2 instance. So what happens is, let's say you launch an EC2 instance, you terminate. When you terminate an EC2 instance, the Elastic IP get disassociated. And when you relaunch an EC2 instance, by default, it will have a new public IP address. But you can reassociate or you can tag that Elastic IP, which got deassociated from the previous termination, and you can attach to the new, this brand new EC2 instance. So this way, you can preserve the Elastic IP. Now, as I mentioned, there are multiple requirements. There are multiple requests. One, uh, many a time, what you use a proprietary software, right? Proprietary any business complex application where you want to have fixed sets of IP addresses from a whitelisting perspective. Certain times you also do a, a whitelisting in your company that okay, if traffic is allowed from this specific IP address, and only allow. In certain cases, your IP address already defined in AWS, and you whitelist it on your on-prem site from a flow traffic flow perspective. So that way, Elastic IP can help you. Security group, NECL, we spoke about very uh, very in detail. Security stateless in nature, uh, works on an EC2 level, second line of defense, and is a stateful kind of stuff. NECL is more like uh, you have a default NACL is created. When VPC is created, uh, it's by default, it's created with the VPC. It works on a subnet level. Default NECL, uh, and again, the sec first line of defense. The next important thing is VPC endpoint and VPC peering. Okay, uh, VPC endpoint and VPC peering. There are a couple, a uh, few services like S3, DynamoDB, right, or even SQS. This VPC or uh, this service works like outside VPC. You cannot put them into VPC, right? So now that means, let's say if you have an EC2 instance uh, which you launch in a private subnet, that will not be able to connect to uh, the SQS, right? Because that's outside VPC, and your EC2 instance is within VPC. There exactly. VPC endpoints can help you, right? So any S3 bucket, DynamoDB, SQS, you can connect to those services with help of VPC endpoint. So what happens is they define a kind of a private link with a private IP address. So SQS, uh, that particular SQS get attached, I mean that SQS service get attached as a gateway or as a private link to VPC. And then you can access via EC2 instance or via Lambda or anywhere which deploys within private subnet to that services very fast, very secure, and a private way. Because as I mentioned, private link, so it's not going to the public route. It is very specifically via private route using private IP address. So that's about private link. VPC pairing, let's say for example, you have two VPCs. Uh, one is, let's say, within the same region in the same AWS account. The second is across, let's say, in a different account, let's say in the same region or a different region. The VPC pairing, you can pair those two VPCs. A and B, you can pair it together. So what the advantage is, any services which is launched in a private or public can easily access another service of private or public via pairing link. So you create a private link, a, pre, a pairing link, a pairing connection, and with that connection, they can easily exchange the data without going to the internet route within the private, within the two network itself. But one thing you need to ensure there is the IP address range of both the VPCs should not be overlapping. So the IP address which you use, let's say in VPC A, the IP address which you use in VPC B should not be overlapping in any relation they had to be completely different. If they are not overlapping, then only VPC pairing will work successfully. And again, the VPC pairing can be within the same account across different regions, or it can be in different account in different regions. 
So that's both the model works fine. So that's about VPC, the different components of it. The couple of best practices I want to call it out. Uh, it's a small, small practice which you can implement. Uh, always try to use custom VPCs. I think we already talk about it. Law define private text is what you can have. For connecting to private uh, instance, you use a jump server or any sorts of host, uh, Bayesian host kind of a thing. Bayesian host is like more like a dummy box, dummy jump box via which you can connect to any. So this way you can pay for any sort of internet hours, public chain. In my EC demo also I mentioned, please do ensure do not open your security group to 000. That means it's publicly available anywhere, any person in anywhere, not just India, US, China, anywhere. They can try to access your EC2 instance globally. So please do ensure that you bound to very specific to your IP address. And in the, from the drop down, you can select my IP address or a custom IP address of your company or any block of IP address that you can give. But do ensure you do not open to 0, 0, 0. Again, the same thing. Do not open the port 22. Port 22 is for SSH. Do not open to 0, 0, 0. The important thing which we should not be doing ever in our life, never share your public key. To GitHub. Now, GitHub can be public repository, private repository. I will request you never even up, incidentally even upload to private repositories also. When I say keys, keys can be of two types. One is the SSH keys, which help you to get into EC2 instance. Second is like your username, password, uh, access key, secret key, anything, any confidential thing is a best practice you should not store into GitHub, whether it's private or public, because you never know. Today it's private. But let's say incidentally, it cannot, it can even be made as public. One check and it make public and your all credentials are out in the market and you're done. So do ensure that you never save it, whether it's even private also. So those are the best, I mean, say introduction and the best practices and other details about it. Here is a one end to end diagram, whatever we have spoken a lot theoretically about VPC, right? So here is a diagram overall how it works, right? So as I was talking about, this is a VPC pairing, right? Like let's say you have two or three VPCs, you can use a VPC pairing via this kinds of stuff, right? This is how you can have different, you can define your own VPC in the entire AWS uh, network infrastructure. Then you can break it down your VPCs into different subnets. You can have the security group, the private subnet, the public subnet. This is act as a NACL, right? You can have the NACL part of it. You can have a security group on the instance level. Then you can have a route table. So as I mentioned, any one subnet can be connected to one route table, right? So this is the subnet. This is a route table. The subnet also has a one NACL, right? So you have a NACL here and then you can have different stuff. Like you can have VPCs or you can have EC2 instance. You have net gateway and those kinds of stuff based on the type of the subnet. Net gateway will always be, remember it will have in the public subnet. Jump server, net gateway, are like the public facing entity. So they have to be by default in public subnet. If you place them incidentally also in private subnet, your entire VPC topology will fail. So this is how you can have it. Similarly here, you can see the end point. Via end point, you can connect to your S3, your, your Amazon, your DynamoDB, there is an internet gateway via which you can connect to internet. And finally, you have a VPN gateway via which you can connect to your on-prem. So these are the the structure. You will be easily able to understand the blueprint, how it works. Plus, I will say, uh, first, please go through the theoretical part, then you go through it. That's how you will be able to connect the dots. And then at the last, the thing which I missed in the previous slide also is the VPC flow logs. In AWS, it, the best thing about which I like AWS is uh, the kind of monitoring and the kind of transparency they provide with each of the services by, by maintaining the logs. Now, in case of VPC also, you, you can have something called as a flow log. So any, any traffic moving in and out of VPC, any exchange of data that happens, that get log and this flow log, you can either put it into CloudWatch or S3 from a compliance perspective. I mean, the, the best thing is when you're working on an enterprise production scale, this flow logs are the best mechanism to even understand from where geographical region your VPC is getting traffic, right? Like if I talk about my recent experience, 
uh, with help of VPC flow log, we were able to identify one of the uh, miss. There was one of the block that identified is very and I'll quickly go through the cloud formation also. Cloud formation is very important. Uh, I would say it's renowned in the market as an infrastructure as a code. Uh, generally, people use this cloud formation. Someone uses Terraform, uh, which is from an HashiCorp. I would say there is no uh, right or wrong. I might personally uh, prefer cloud formation if I'm working in and out on AWS. Couple of reasons. It's very simple approach and all. But if we go back to the basics of inf what is infrastructure as a code, let's say very simple of it. I ask you, you have you have to launch one EC2 instance, only one EC2 instance every day. Let's say you have just joined a new job. So you will be happy to do that because this is a cloud. So you will love to do it one day, one week or one month. Let's say I ask you to do this for two years. You will hate your job. You're like, what is what I'm doing here? Every day I come up, I launch EC2 instance. That's also it's okay. But I tell you, you launch EC2 instance, log into EC2 instance, and set up Python and Java in that instance. That's more above and beyond of it, right? And you will get fed up. It's like what I'm doing. After one month itself, you will get fed up. Every day I'm coming around, launching an EC2 instance, launching around it. What I'm doing here, I'm not learning something, right? There exactly cloud formation comes as a survivor. You write, I mean, let's say you do it one time, you do it two times. If someone asks you to do it third time, what you do? You write a cloud formation where you not only define the resources, but also what you need to do within, let's say, you need to install Python, you need to install Java in your EC2. You define all the things in the resources section also, in the installation part or configuration part. Every time you launch cloud formation, and cloud formation will not only launch the EC2 instance, but will know all of the setup that's required. That was one example of EC2 instance. Let's say I tell you that, okay, any enterprise platform, bare minimum consists of 20 to 25 different services or same sets of services based on the use case. I ask you to launch all those services, even one time manually. You will do it for one time, but there might be multiple chance of failures. You forgot to connect those services. You forgot to connect, let's open the ports. You forgot to attach the right IAM rules. These are, I'll tell you, my real life experiences are in there. When you ask, when people ask you to do it manually, for sure there are errors. You will make errors when you're doing it for the first time. And it's not a repeatable pattern. There exactly AWS, what cloud formation help you do it. You, whatever the things, the recipe that's required to launch your entire platform, that recipe is something you write it into a script, into a file in a form of a YAML or a JSON. And that file, you keep launching every time. So you don't have to remember anything. Plus, if there is new person entering or coming into your system, or if you're passing out to someone else, this becomes very simplified as that, okay, here are the scripts. You launch that script and it will take care, right? So very simplified package way of launching your infrastructure. So from a diagram itself, you can understand, right? Create and manage AWS resources. So many resources, you will get fed up. It's like, no, I'm not doing it. In simple terms, if I ask you, the year is a one file which will launch 15 of resources. You will love to do it. That's fine. I can just go and launch that. Upload to AWS console. Boom, all the resources will be launched with the right configuration. So that's the beauty of the cloud formation. The best example is Expedia. There are various, I mean, Expedia is one of them. I would say there are various other companies I've seen. I mean, it's a, I would say cloud formation nowadays is a fundamental service where every platform or every solution will have it, right? And again, uh, I would say even if you don't have it, please ensure that you follow cloud formation. It will help you not only from simplifying your operational overhead, it will also help you from terms of, let's say, if you want, if you want to launch your entire platform in another region or let's say for another client, you can't keep manually wiring up the things, right? You need some automated way so you don't have to put more pressure or having more robust documentation each and every, you have to put open port 22, you have to give an IPS IM policies. The manual routes are very difficult. Again, on top of it, you have to give that permissions also to the user to go and do it. But is in the cloud formation, you just give the cloud formation or to your CI CD tool and it can take care of everything without having less of human involved. And how cloud formation works, as I mentioned, you write your code, nothing but that you have infrastructure as a code, you define it in either YAML or a JSON file. Uh, that's one way. Now the best beauty is cloud formation also as a designer tool, you can drag and drop and AWS can design the, the entire uh, code in YAML or JSON format. You can do any of the approaches. You upload that template into S3 or even if you have it locally, that is also fine. But you upload when you're going to console, you upload that uh, into bucket. Then you click cloud formation and automatically you will see the entire stack get launched. That's how the cloud formation works. Do remember three things. Uh, you have a template 
cloud formation and stack template is nothing but a file that file is either written in, uh, in yaml or in a json that holds the entire definition or configuration of your file cloud formation is a service that come that converts i mean that first interprets converts your templates into a stack stack is a compiled or deployed entire package of your resources let's say i have ec3 uh, ec uh, s3 ec2 lambda dynamo these are the four resources which are defined in a json or a template in a template file that is called as a template why because there is nothing which exists in aws so far i take that file i use cloud formation uh, service cloud formation interprets sees all connections and decks are right then deploys it and the, uh, once the cloud formation is completed what we read as stack stack consists of the resources so now i have the actual resources ec2 s3 dynamo db live running in aws so template cloud formation service and stack remember these three things that's the basic of cloud formation so that's about cloud formation what we have next i will go through the cloud integration services these are the small small services like sqs sns kinesis but this small service are very powerful when it comes to designing any sorts of decoupled services or any sorts of services or architecture which should scale as per the load right let's say for example if i tell you i am going to hit your database with 1 million which is 10 lakhs of records it's very difficult to scale to that kind of a stuff right again 10 lakh is i'm giving you a number let's say i hit with 1 crore i say that i'm going to hit with 10 lakh i hit with 1 crore it's impossible right there exactly what you do is you buffer the request with sqs sqs holds that all the request and then performs the action on top of it right so certain i mean this behavior you could have imagined with youtube right uh, when you're watching and youtube videos and other stuff previously you used to load what exactly it happens here, you know right behind the scene when it is loading it's actually buffering the video contents behind the scene and once it captures in its buffer then it replays at your end so as a end user what you see is it's loading it's capturing it's downloading the data behind the scene that's exact that download is buffering the data so that you can once you have the sufficient block of data you can replay or you can view that video so similarly sqs is simple queuing mess service where what you are queuing is the different any sorts of request any sorts of buffering what you are doing around it so that's the what you are doing around need not to say sqs is 10 years old service of aws yes it's one of the oldest service what aws has offered it's it's very much renowned and used as to decouple the application as i mentioned about let's say you have a database you have a v apis which just write to the database and if you want to decouple right that from 10 lakhs to 1 crore you want to ensure that in any given scenario your database works in a very seamless or flexible manner then you decouple your apis and database with sqs as a service so this way you don't crazily scale out your servers from a cost perspective as well as you served all the requests to your clients the latency wise for sure it's very less less than 10 milliseconds from public to subscribe what that means is as uh, let's say i am a one who is sending a message and let's say there is a lambda or any other services at the uh, consumer side which is going to consume the service lambda is to anything the time it takes from me sending a message to sqs and sqs delivering it to lambda is less than 10 milliseconds the entire route so the latency is much more smaller less than 10 milliseconds is like very less uh, the default retention minimum is for, i mean from 4 days to 14 days which is like more than enough any application ideally i would say generally 4 days is fine but certain times 14 days also is required based on the type of the application nature but 4 days to 14 days is fine no limits on how many messages can be queued messages are delayed up they are read by the consumer consumer share the work to read message and scale horizontally two important point right so for example let's say i am producer i send the request to queue lambda consume it once lambda successfully process that message you don't need that message right let's say i tell that okay hey select query from student table this is what i send the message lambda performs that against database and saves the result back let's say to s3 now lambda has already done the action or the task which i have given so then it automatically deletes the message from the queue just in case if lambda fails due to any reason uh, lambda uh, uh, like let's say the table does not exist or some queries uh, something is wrong with the database the passwords are wrong or passwords are expired 
in that case the message will be put back into the sqs but in case if the message is been successfully processed then it will get automatically delete consumer share the worker or uh, consumer share the work to read the message and scale horizontally so as you see right the consumer also you can have it so the thing which we spoken in the auto scaling right in auto scaling we talk about cp utilization similarly in auto scaling you can also have one more parameter as sqs message depth that means based on the number of sqs messages you can also scale the number of your consumer that can give you the capability to faster process of the messages let's say for an example you are getting a, you are an e-commerce or very simple of it you run a support system for any very big one uh, big product let's say for amazon dot in uh, e-commerce website you are running a support channel where you get keep complaints any sorts of requests or any sorts of things what you get support ticket right and it will become very important for you that you serve all the people in the right time in the rightly manner within the sla there exactly it's also important in simple example i am a one person who's calling amazon dot in for a support you need to ensure that the consumer end you need to have more of the support person on the consumer side so they can pick up my call similar is a concept here if you once you receive the message into sqs there has to be a well defined of consumers to consume that message in a rightly time and get the response back or whatever the taken action on top of it so that's how you can also scale the consumer based on the number of messages in sqs dynamically with the help of auto scale so those kinds of other things you can do and that's how sqs is very it's a simple service but is very renowned when it comes to designing part of it the next is sns i would say another notification services the best part of sns is around in case of sqs like you as i mentioned the message will be picked up by one reader at a time once it reads it's done but let's say you want to send a notification like broadcast for an example uh, very simple of it is like around you got an email notification that okay hey you have a part 3 sessions for cloud practitioner please do register that's a broadcast that means the same message was been sent to all the people across who are interested so similarly if you want to do that kind of a stuff then sns works well sns once a message has been sent it sends to everyone who has subscribed to it that simple means right as i said the interested people the interested people by that means who have registered for the aws user group there are doing will get all the notification that okay hey you have this particular sessions on this time this channel if you are interested please join so that's kinds of stuff in sns when someone publish the notification if you have subscribed to that particular topic or that particular notification you will receive to anyone whether it's aws services or whether it's any sorts of person let's say on emails or any sorts of text messages you can easily get that notification right to sqs lambda or any api gateway or kinesis firewalls so those kinds of aws services which is a to a application to application subscription subscribers or application to person subscribers anything if you have subscribed to that topic then you can easily get it topic is simply you can translate it like an aws user group there are done if you have subscribed or if you are a part of aws user group there are done then you will receive the notification for all the sessions not only cloud practitioner but any session which will be conducted or any news similarly if you have you have subscribed to that particular topic you will receive that notification to any of this module so do remember that similarly it's highly scalable there is uh, there is a like 10000 i would say a 1 lakh what topics you have that's like infinite that's not required from a subscription perspective it's also like i feel like ideally you need like 100 500 or 1000 not more than that 1000 even let's say 10000 what you will need not beyond that subscription is required so from a subscription perspective the number of people can subscribe a topic or the number of topic is decent enough that you can do it there are different subscribers as i mentioned from a to a and a to b things like http https email messages mobile notification sqs lambda there are other are there but generally do remember with sns you can have application to application with which means any of the aws services application to person which means any sorts of direct human way to interact via push email notification via direct messages or other medium of push notification so that's how about sns next is kinesis kinesis is very important services when it comes to real time kind of a stuff right real time if you want to do it uh, very real time that okay you get something you want to uh, do that kind of a processing around that stuff and you take care of it like very simple of it 
uh, very simple example if i talk about real time is let's say you're working in a chemical factory right in a reactor factory where it's very important that you analyze each of the sensor data iot sensor data like if the heat is going about this uh, uh, temperature you immediately warn the people something is wrong because it's very crucial to the lives of people as well as it can just lead to a disaster those kinds of different applications what you have right like some another application can be an air condition or any sort of a thing that if temperature goes up out beyond this that you send certain notification that please turn on the ac or do ensure that you shut down it or you have do some maintenance work to bring down that value below the threshold bar so that kind of real time if you want to process something then kenes is the best service which will help you this service is widely used with big data streaming right with big data if you want to do any sorts of streaming this is the best service in aws that people uses in and out so anything which uh, respect to collect process analyze real stream data then kenesis can help you out kenesis provides different other services kenesis data stream kenesis firehost analytics and video streamer from terms of processing the data data stream means any sorts of traditional binary data firehost is more like a buffer if you want to uh, collect the data and flush into s3 store it then firehost acts like a buffer buffering service what you can say instead of writing each one one message at a time you buffer it in one go and write it at one time kenesis analytics is let's say you want to uh, process the live streaming data then analytics is makes sense and video streaming is more let's say you are streaming like right? a uh, very simple covid example if i tell you let's say people have a uh, mask or not that kind of application you want to build and if people don't have mask don't open the gate you can do simple of it you have a video that captures let's say you have a on prem video that captures around it and i think someone asked me about the iot example right your the iot makes much more sense let's say you have some iot device which is installed at the gate of your building which is capturing the video feed then you have a kenesis video stream kvs which is connected to it right with the connector kvs behind the scenes runs some con consumers to do analytics and identify frame by frame whether this person has a mask or not if it doesn't have don't open the gate unless that person wear a mask this is a common example you would have seen many people have created on the linkedin or it has even real life example also many government has been uh, deployed the solution there exactly iot kenesis video stream and your machine learning works very well where you capture the video feed from your on prem on prem i mean the physical site location put it into kvs with the help of connectors kvs behind the scene can things runs like lambda or any ec2 sage maker machine learning algorithm to analyze your frame by frame and decide the action which they want to take so that is kenesis around it next i'll quickly go through the developer tool stack looking at the time developer tool stacks is more let's say uh, you want to do ci cd like continuous integration continuous deployment like very simple of it you as a developer writes a code and you want that code to be deployed to ec2 instance or you to do entire route you run your you you put your code you need to run the test cases you have to launch ec2 and then finally run the code in the ec2 instance if you want to do that entire cycle you can use things like aws developer tools which this is the entire big umbrella which consists of code commit code build code deploy and code pipeline these are the four services which aws provide i'll take a very simple example code commit is more like your github big bucket those kinds of code repository aws has its own code repository which is available at free of cost you can use it like same like how you do in github you can do same kind of check in and everything no difference in the syntax no difference in the branches it just that aws provides managely and it can very easily integrate with other services that's a beauty of it code build is let's say uh, many people someone even asked me about web development and all the people uh, who are more of a web development or who have done like java and all they would have understand you write java code and then you convert that java code into form of a jar file okay the compile package after you compile that you export as a jar file or you create a kind of a war file kind of as a package that kind of packaging is done by a code build so code build clone the code or download the code from git code repository then j unit any sorts of testing any sorts of scanning that needs to be done and then after all the code compliance and everything has been done it package the code and that package is nothing but deployable package which is deployed via code deploy into ec2 fargate lambda any of the services like any of the aws services that's how the, this three services have been there 
and code pipeline is like a one simulated i mean pipeline which clubs code deploy code build and uh, code build code deploy as a visual kind of a stuff so that's how this four tools help you from terms of the entire operational activity otherwise you have to manually go not just write the code run the test cases build the pipeline on top of it and then deploy where with a simple deployment it can be done and the best part is it's not just limited to you any developer in your company can use this out unless and until the code runs perfectly fine and the test cases are written right the things will work fine and you will see a significant improvement in the productivity of your developer so this is one example of workflow the same thing which i mentioned you have a code code commit as a developer you push the code in the code commit then the code pipeline triggers the entire workflow of build test de deploy in dev and then finally deploy in prod so those are work visual workflow for your reference need not to worry about it no need to mug up this is just for your reference how the actual real life example works as a blueprint perspective next we'll go as a monitoring services when it comes to monitoring services simple of it cloud watch as i mentioned in the vp slide also the best thing why i love aws is that the capability to log very transparently and warn developer where in every place where they are making a mistake do remember there are two things which aws provides from terms of monitoring cloud watch cloud trail this is a very common question across all the exams cloud watch is used for the monitoring of aws resources let's say you have lambda you have glue you have redshift you have vpc all those logs will get saved into cloud watch but let's say i as a user i as anshik jain fire an api the api is putting a file into s3 so in that case where exactly that should get tracked that will get tracked into cloud trails not in cloud watch so do remember this is a very basic question anything which is respect to aws services like services to services or any action services does like similarly even though ec2 also fires boto3 scripts that will get logs into cloud watch but if i do fire as a boto3 script for my machine that will get into log into cloud trail because humans are firing an api which will get into cloud trail so that is do remember the difference between cloud watch and cloud trail so cloud watch as i mentioned it gives you the real time logging capability from all the services uh, you can create you can your own custom dashboard you can create it you can track the metrics and you can do all other stuff right very simple of example is you want to track the cpu utilization of the ec2 instance to ensure that your ec2 is working fine and you don't need to scale and all that kind of thing you can do easily with the cloud watch and couple of concept what you have is metrics metrics is an important uh, parameter which you want to track as i mentioned in a previous example cpu that's one of the metrics you can do right cost another metrics what you can have dimension second is like filter and i say metrics cpu but i want to see the see a metrics of one particular instance that's what i do a filtering based on the name based on the keys or based on the instance id so that's a dimension statistics is like more like an average mean max sum that kind of distribution what you want to give give me an average across 24 hours give me a maximum across one week those kinds across kind of an arithmetic across a time period like the aggregation across a specified time period will a statistics alarm is like a kind of an alarm like normally what we have an alarm that that uh, you set up an alarm at 6 am in the morning at 6 am the alarm will trigger and you will wake up right based on the noise similarly the same concept has been there in aws there is an alarm where you deploy a time okay you go and invoke a lambda at 6 pm ist it will does the same thing at 6 pm it will generate an event that event will be captured by lambda and lambda will perform the action that's simple of it like for example if i take a simple example at my end is i have written a lambda i have written i have generated a cloud world event which sends which invokes a lambda at 3 pm ist sends a billing for the previous 24 hours what is a billing of previous 24 hours is an exam uh, that sends me every email notification every 3 pm ist so that kind of application what you can build with the help of alarms and dashboard is more like a consolidated view which you can see that okay hey i have five ec2 instances where i want to see their cpu their memory their network those kinds of into one view one dashboard then cloud what dashboard can help next cloud trail as i mentioned uh, that if you want to track any action taken by user role or any services that are record events as a cloud trail so anything which is user roles or aws service take behalf of user as as a cloud trail 
the cloud trail you can do simple of thing you can view the events you can download the trail you can download the events create a trails subscribe the notification of it like subscribe the so notification very simple example is um, you're working you have like hundreds of cloud engineer in your company you want to ensure that every user which launches a service by default it get track tag with the keys name and the email id there you can do something like that by default you can subscribe to notification that whenever there is a new trail trail get in uh, put into sns and sns invokes a lambda lambda then tags a particular resource with a key those kinds of application you can build with help of this create and subscribe to sns token file permission you can ship into cloud watch logs you can do it in s3 uh log management and data which will see what exactly that it is cloud trail insights what you can identify you can just focus on specific uh, get insights around it how exactly uh, how much failure it is how things have been working those kinds of insights you can see you can encrypt it and you can share with other accounts right cloud trails uh, you can do those kinds of stuff do you remember cloud trail events are of two types one is a management event second is a data event management event is more like create subnet attach a role policies like anything which is administrative purpose is management anything which is like more of an like a data event get data delete data put up date data like an object kind of stuff that falls into data event also one important thing which i missed here is the data are available for 90 days of activity so entire thing is available for 90 days and by default cloud trail is enabled when you create your account okay so this about cloud trail uh trails as i mentioned as we gone through you can create the trails for all the regions or for one region it's always recommended that you create the trails for all the regions rather than maintaining it one one regions okay uh insights gives you an unusual activity that is performed someone unauthenticated try to access it some access keys are becoming a problem someone is trying to access that unauthorized access those kinds of insight you can give and there are certain detective and preventive best practices uh detective is like you create trails uh by default do in the cloud trail is enabled by default but you have to enable the trail okay so cloud trail is enabled but you have to create a trail or at your own so do remember that difference apply the trails to all aws accounts enable cloud trail log integrated that ensure that cloud trails are not compromised and integrated with the cloud watch so it also get reserved in cloud watch outside beyond 90 days right so let's say as i mentioned about the 90 days if you want to go and have more than 90 days if you keep preserving in s3 or cloud watch then you can go beyond the 90 days also and there are other best practices preventive that you have centralized s3 bucket from a persistent you have encryption you have list privilege access for that s3 bucket you have mfa on that s3 bucket where you are saving the cloud watch trail object life cycle and don't give any permission which is cloud trail full access policy those are the best practices to ensure that no one manipulates your cloud watch trails manipulation in terms of manipulating i mean changing the values deleting it or incidentally deleting the bucket those kinds of activities are not done from a compliance purpose or from a safety purpose you not only just enable it but also restrict those kinds of stuff next the important thing is around the shared responsibility shared responsibility is very important so far we have learned about security monitoring all those kinds of stuff aws tells you very importantly that we are responsible to maintain certain things as well as customers are also responsible to maintain few things right now very simple of it right i'll try to cover up in uh, at a high level let's say for example you launch an ec2 instance okay now aws will take care of everything from terms of network deed or a network attack or customer data which is stored in database is proper integrated uh, no one stole that hard disk from their data center those kinds of things aws will take care but let's say you open the port to universal and your ec2 get compromised there aws will not do anything that's your responsibility or let's say you have that pam file or ssh keys incidentally uploaded in the public github and your ec2 get compromised there you are responsible not aws is responsible for it right so anything which is in blue shade you will see where a customer is responsible anything which is in orange is aws responsible there also you will see a pattern as you go more from infrastructure container to manage service you will see the responsibility of customer significantly getting reduced and aws is taking care that's how the managed service reduce the operational overhead on top of it but do remember the key basic principle security is always a shared responsibility neither aws owns a fully and neither customer owns a fully in all the segments 
it's a shared responsibility based on the type of service which you uh, launch from a particular pillar you have to share with it okay so go through that in detail about how and what kind of shared responsibility you do this is a very important topic i would say from not from certification even from your professional life experience next and the last topic what we have is the well architect framework well architect framework is more important i would say where aws try to help you to understand the best practices across each of the services so far we have understood in the last segment about the uh, shared responsibility what thing customer should be doing what aws is doing right but now comes up that okay how i can understand the best practices from terms of security from terms of the cost optimization from terms of reliability performance efficiency and operational excellence this is very important for architects when you designing any of your platform you do ensure this five pillars and the pointers in each of these five pillars is what you cover up and if you cover up all of these pointers as all of these pillars and the pointers under these pillars that means that you have defined or designed an architecture which is well architected so do ensure that and that's why aws has come up there's a good blog i mean you need not to go i mean i would say if you have some time please go through that white paper it's very important that once you should go through that white paper i would say personally i have seen people having a print out of that because it's a very fundamental and very basic block for any architect to go through that first if you want to call yourself as a architect this is the first step in stone where you should be knowing in and out about it because it will cover up all the segments all the best practices which you should be knowing around it and next i would say 2 years 3 years back i mean if i talk about 2016 and 17 you have to go through documentation and get some understanding and all aws even simplify that thought process also for you that over it now aws has come up with a tool itself which is called as aws review tool war tool well architect tool in the aws console itself so every person who has aws account if you search well architect you will see a well architect review tool itself in aws where whatever the documentation best practices have been mentioned the same architecture once you have designed you can analyze it there are certain questions which you have totally i remember i think it's somewhere around 52 or 55 questions you have across this five pillars you can answer them and at the end you get a report the best practices and the kind of a documentation which help you to analyze the gap across each of the pillars and you can define around it okay how we can do it right i've seen there are professionally many customers many clients just connect for doing the war uh with the consulting partners of aws to understand where exactly is the gap which pillar they should focus is it cost optimization is it security because for us everything is green everything is best unless things broke right but there has to be someone who tells you that okay hey please watch out the things what you have implemented in this pillar is not as per the industry best practice it may be best practice for you with your limited knowledge but not as per the industry best practices there exactly this tool help you a lot and it's much more simple you just answer 52 questions i mean the best is i mentioned go to the documentation and answer this questions the end report is where exactly you will get all the answers where exactly or which pillar your architect is lagging behind architecture is lagging behind where you should be focusing around it so i would say that's about from my end where we have gone through couple of things glue databases vpcs uh, shared responsibilities uh, and as well as the war tool now i'll jump to the question and sections and please feel free even if you're not able to post the questions here in the chat and if you want some career gap or career help some other blocker where you are not able to share it publicly you need my help please reach out to me on the linkedin or on the github i'll be happy to answer all of those questions okay let me quickly go through uh, the questions so uh, what is a cider what is slash extreme no one can take lesser than that uh, from this like 13 max it okay cider in simple i would say i mean this is a very uh, network technical term i will try to make it more simple for you guys cider is more simple as like block of ip addresses like the let's say you have sets of ip addresses which you can leverage any ip address from that pool that is what is cider slash 16 is sufficient enough the any complex application which you build let's say that application is used throughout the globe slash 16 will suffice your need so that's what minimum you can use is slash 6 maximum what you can use is slash 16 minimum is what you can use is slash 28 okay
that's one uh the around what you have is around dpc can we connect ec to instance of one aws account with the help of another aws vice classical link yes you can connect via vpc link you can do that you can connect one one ec2 to another ec2 vpc pairing is what we talk about around it right yeah once you have the vpc v, uh, vpc pairing in place the one ec2 can directly you can jump or connect from one ec2 to another ec2 can you please differentiate between the security group and nacl i think i've already mentioned about security group works on ec2 level nacl works on a subnet level uh, that's how the difference between this can you tell us there are 200 subnet in vpc but but need some more subnet as private and if yes then how can can get over for sure there are certain limits i think 100 is what soft limit what you have subnet if you need more subnets you can reach out to aws support ticket and you can create more but i would say 200 subnets are not required because the more you create subnets uh the more cyber range you need and end of the day uh you also need to understand your subnet has to be directly proportional on the component wise so 200 still if you need based on the requirement you can go and reach out to support and get more subnets and accordingly you can decide it uh so with the help of a cloud formation we make the automated script like pre configured script Yes, you can do. As I mentioned about the bootstrapping approach, bootstrapping is exactly the same thing. Let's say, for example, you want an EC2 instance, and that EC2 instance should have, let's say, Nginx or Python Java. That is what exactly you can do as a part of the user data. So, if you see uh, the cloud formation in the resource section of EC2, there is a section called as user data. Within user data, you can do any, you can run any of these scripts, Python script, shell script, or Java. You can do anything, and there you can do all this kinds of configuration. What you can do. Uh, how does an AWS pipeline interact with the cloud formation? So AWS pipeline, or if I understand correctly, code pipeline doesn't directly interact. Uh, like a interaction, I would say, more like a visual workflow in code deploy, or where there you have the different functionalities where you can uh, launch with uh, cloud formation to do, let's say, deployment or all of this stuff. So from a deployment perspective, cloud formation will help. is there any acknowledgement received by aws sns whether the message is sent and received properly to the destination uh, not as such i would say there are certain metrics what you can capture via cloud watch or from terms of the message notification but there is no direct as kind of a notification which you receive on per message level but for sure if you want to track you can track it via cloud watch so uh, aws card isn't charged for using aws for services yes as i mentioned a code commit is what you can use as a more of a freely services and the best practice code commit is more natively integrated with aws in terms of the authentication and other services that's why it's best to use uh the next question is if we connect uh, our sqs and sns with email and receive a notification whether an email is uploaded to an s3 bucket now in our email part if we move uh, if we have a type move in our email app then image is shifted to okay so very simple i think this is a use case what you're talking about this is a standard use case what you have right uh you can have let's say let's say for example you upload a file if i club three of your questions you have let's say a, you have a image which you upload to s3 as similarly as soon as you upload an image in s3 under events you can either define an sqs or an event or sorry sns or an sqs both sqs and sns you can plug with lambda and lambda can do anything lambda can move it to another account lambda can create a thumbnail or lambda can just move it from one bucket to another within one account you can do any operation within that lambda and that lambda can be triggered via event management in the s3 bucket itself so that's a very simple approach and that's a standard design i would say standard pattern also if you see in aws blocks you will easily get that any other questions guys i think that's all i think i've answered most of them i think uh, that's all uh, sanjay yeah so thank yeah thank you yeah thank you guys thank you please so please if you have any questions post it on the slack channel of the user group or reach out to me on linkedin i'll be happy to answer them yeah thank you so much sanjay uh, for this insightful session and uh, for being a part of our aws cloud practitioner training and uh, i'm certain that all of the students who attended this session uh, gained a lot of knowledge from you and i would also like to thank all the learners who have attended the session and made the session a successful one also uh, at last please uh, stay tuned for the updates of date and time for the next uh, for the coming session thank you so much everybody for attending this session and thank you so much sanjay thank you have a wonderful day thank you guys thank you